In April of 1495, the Crown of Castile broke their monopoly deal with famed explorer Christopher Columbus and began issuing licenses to other navigators for the West Indies. One of the first to benefit from the new arrangement was Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian merchant, explorer, and cartographer. Vespucci is said to have led four expeditions in service to both Spain and Portugal in which he explored uncharted waters around South America, discovering new land masses that he dubbed the New World in Letters Home, much to the dismay of Columbus's supporters. One of those land masses was Argentina. The name Argentina has Italian origins loosely translating to made of silver, and for much of its history the country lived up to its name, yielding fortunes from its abundant natural resources for the ruling class and offering the prospect of prosperity for immigrants around the world. Today we're going to be speaking to Professor Jeffrey Jones about his case entitled Ernesto Tornquist, Making a Fortune on the Pampas. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call. So we are all sitting there in the classroom. The professor walks in. And, and they look up and you know it's coming. Oh, the dreaded cold call. Jeff Jones researches the history and impact of globalization. His focus is on the role of entrepreneurs and business enterprises. And boy, all those things are appropriate for the case we're going to talk about today. Jeff, thanks for joining me. Great pleasure. It's great to have you here, and I enjoyed reading this case. I've had the great fortune to to have been to Argentina Mm. a few times. It's a beautiful Mm -hmm. place, and it was really interesting to hear about this period and its history, which obviously was so crucial to what we know of Argentina today. Mm -hmm. So I think people will really enjoy hearing about it. Let me ask you to begin just by, you know, sort of set up the case for us. Who's the protagonist in this case, and what's the setting? So Ernesto Torquest is really one of the leading entrepreneurs in 19th century Argentina. He becomes, by the 1900s, actually one of the richest men in uh, Latin America. He was compared to the lost childs, Mm -hmm. uh, all the rich people. And it's a name now that's largely forgotten. Yeah. What prompted you to write this? You're a, you're a business historian. You know, yeah. uh, I think it's a distinctive mark of Harvard Business School that we have uh, such a focus on business history. But what caught your attention about this case? This case occupies an important place in my MBA course called Entrepreneurship and Global Capitalism. That deals with the role of entrepreneurs in globalization from the 19th century to the present day. Now, an important takeaway from that course is that globalization has absolutely not been a linear process. Mm. There have been shocks, uh, waves, all sorts of things have gone on. And Argentina is a prime example of, of that. As I say in the case, by the beginning of the 20th century, the country was one of the richest countries in the world, mm-hmm. far richer than most European countries. And that's the era of Ernesto Tornquist. But the following 100 years, the country progressively loses its its position. And in the last three or four decades, it's been a prime example of political and economic turbulence. So the case is very important in reminding students that things just don't go on in a smooth, linear pattern. And Argentina now is one of the great mystery cases for economic and business historians. What on earth happened yeah. to this country? How did it go wrong? What was the cause of that? Yeah, and the case does a great job of sort of citing some of the things that may have been turning points and decisions that may have taken the country in the wrong direction. So we'll get more into mm-hmm. that later. What was Argentina like uh, before the Europeans arrived? Well, the uh, as you said, the Spaniards described it as a new world, but it was only new to them. We know now that the whole of the Americas were the home of technologically advanced and sophisticated cultures, the Incas in Peru, the Aztecs in Central America. Now, Argentina doesn't have Incas or Aztecs, but it was by no means uh, empty. There were settled agricultural-based civilizations. Um, the most interesting one it was called by the Spanish, the Diaguitas. They are near the uh, Bolivian borders. They have advanced agricultural systems with irrigation systems. They have amazing pottery, amazing skills in textiles, and they were very good soldiers as well. They stopped the Incas advancing into Argentina, mm. and they're the reason why the Spaniards were so slow to get their hold on Argentina. They fought them off for decades after the first ones came. And in fact, 
their resistance to the Spanish lasted until the middle of the 17th century. Mm -hmm. You describe in the case, uh, <laughs> it's not funny, but it sounded a little funny the way that you wrote it. One of the early expeditions apparently yeah. did not fare well, uh, and there was only one survivor from that expedition who watched the rest of his crew get eaten on the shore. Yeah, these people were tough. They were tough people, and they didn't appreciate the Spanish. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. Uh, maybe they tasted good, though. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so what led to the bid for ind independence? As we start to get into mm. the Tornquist's time, this is about the time of independence. Tornquist is a bit later, but as elsewhere in Latin America, it all happens because of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. Uh, the French overran Spain, and when it was occupied by the French, the local white Spanish elite decide to assert their independence and uh, that happens throughout the subcontinent and it happens in Argentina mm -hmm. too. So it's a transfer of power from the Spanish to the local born white elite. Yeah, and this was happening sort of across the continent and other places Perhaps. at the same time. Yeah, it's a very messy process which explains why Latin America fell behind from the levels of income and wealth that it had in the 18th century because there isn't a you know, coherent countries like Argentina or Chile don't emerge spontaneously. There's a lot of disagreement about boundaries, borders, and decades of lost income. Yeah, yeah. How important was the conquest in the desert? That's one of the uh, things mm. that you cite in the case, and it sounded like that was one of those turning points. Absolutely. This starts in the 1870s. So the southern parts of Argentina, Pampas, what, whatever, were still occupied by the indigenous. In the 1870s, the Argentina army, armed with the latest uh, military weapons, decides to expropriate all the indigenous. They attack it, they kill people, they expropriate land, and they basically give it very cheaply to uh, members of the elite. This is a huge area. It's an area bigger than the current state of California. Mm. It's immensely fertile. And this is the land where the Argentinians then build giant cattle farms, wheat farms, and it's really the basis of their vibrant uh, agricultural economy. So that sort of sets the stage for them and to move into this era of prosperity yeah. that the case gets into. One of the things that's called out in the case is the role of foreign investment. This is the first push into globalization, and investment was a big part of it. Mm. How did that work in Argentina? So Argentina had all this land, but it didn't have infrastructure. Foreign investment plays a key role in building the infrastructure which enables agricultural exports to take place. So there's massive British investment in railroads. So the British build the whole railroad system of Argentina. Other foreign capital goes into ports, into processing mm -hmm. facilities. There's a huge amount of capital available in Europe, which is a capital exporting region. And there's a huge demand for it in Argentina. And so the two come together. Yeah. And you talk about the growth of the manufacturing sector, the growth of the agricultural mm -hmm. sector. These things didn't come without their own set of challenges. So what are some of the things that they encountered that could have stymied some of that growth along the way? Well, a growing and exporting commodities was quite a straightforward process because they're bulk commodities. As long as you build the infrastructure, there's the markets. People are anxious for food in Europe and, and in the United States. The more tricky area was trying to develop any kind of manufacturing um, sector. Mm -hmm. And that's tricky for reasons that have continued to be a problem for Argentina. First of all, the market is rather small. It's like 8 million, I think, in 1914. So it's a small market. Then there's geography. Mm. Argentina was a very long way away from any other market. And it's surrounded by countries like Brazil and Chile, which are far poorer. So they're not a good market. Yeah. So that was a huge problem. Then it has no energy. It has no coal deposits. So in the 19th century, uh, Europe and the US grew their industries on the basis of steam power generated by coal and a bit later on oil. Mm -hmm. Argentina doesn't have it. And then there's finally, there's the problem of human capital. You know, by the 1900s, Argentina was by far the most educated part of Latin America, but its literacy rate is 50%. By then, the literacy rate in the United States is 92%. Wow. That's not a great basis to build any kind of like sophisticated 
industry. It's just fine for your commodities. It's progressively less fine for anything, you know, involving any kind of technological sophistication. Yeah. So what did they do? Like, how do you address a problem like that? They address it in the way the Tornquist addresses it. Mm -hmm. And that is he and other people like him diversified across sectors rather than investing in depth. Yeah. So like in the United States, you get the emergence of um, steel companies or consumer goods companies, and they focus on one industry and they build a lot of technological expertise about that industry. Tornquest doesn't really go there. He has scarce managerial capability, scarce human capital. Mm -hmm. So he diversifies across a very wide range of industries without going into depth in any of them. So there's no like brand building, for example, that we're going to see in, in the United States. So he's handling scarce resources like that, yeah. breadth rather than depth. Yeah. And he was into everything. I mean, was there any – so you in the case, it describes that he was into yeah. agriculture and into manufacturing and into sugar refineries and into whaling. Uh, was there anything that he wasn't involved in? I, actually, I don't think there was anything he was involved in. What the guy it did, he built up a, like a core set of skills, a core set of political contacts, mm. and he used those to leverage across, across sectors. And he had core business in finance – and another core business in real estate. So that's giving him the kind of financial resources to diversify and buy often. He bought a lot of companies. Yeah, That's what he does. He diversifies across sectors. What was he perceived like in the community? Uh, he obviously had strong political connections, and that's how he was able to accomplish a lot of what he did. But yeah. was he liked by the people in the community? He uh, deliberately keeps and chooses to keep a very low profile, probably because he has so much power, yeah. uh, actually. He is, however, influential in various decisions which raise controversy. In particular, he's very important in influencing the government to set the exchange rate in such a way that favours commodity exports, of which he's one of the biggest. And that kind of incident and others, he's often portrayed by critics as yeah, carrying bags of money. And also his ethnic origins as like a German are sometimes emphasized too. It's like, you know, yeah. kind of suspicious that he's he's in it for the money, really. Right. So it was sort of a robber baron type figure. Uh, absolutely. A robber baron and a kind of a foreign robber baron. Although, you know, it made little sense because Argentina is a country of immigrants anyway. So most of them were yeah. Where from somewhere, somewhere else. So let's talk about that for a minute because we're in a climate right now in the U.S., obviously. In, fa in fact, in many places in the world where uh, immigration is a very hot topic, uh, it's led mm. to a populist uprising in many places. This was a country that was largely built like, like the U.S., you yeah, could say, absolutely. on the backs of immigrants. Can you talk a little bit about the role that played for the rise of the Turnquist's empire? His father, right, is born in Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> of Scandinavian and you know, German ethnicity. So he is a prime immigrant. And I think there are like six or seven giant business groups which have developed by the early 20th century. They are all founded by first or second generation immigrants. Mm -hmm. The key entrepreneurs are all immigrants or the sons of immigrants. So that's very, very important. They had higher skill levels. They had the right kind of connections to build successful businesses. And then many of the blue-collar workers, too, are immigrants. And that reflects the fact that the education system in Argentina was not good. Mm -hmm. So these people brought the kind of essential skills that were needed. And it's the same story in the United States. These people, unlike the United States, rarely even took Argentinian nationality. They kept their own passports. It didn't seem very important to them. So you, you had a country, a hugely successful country, which is also incredibly cosmopolitan. And you could say it was a prime example of the benefits of an open immigration system to, yeah. to a country's development. It's interesting that they didn't assume the nationality. And do you think that may have something to do with the fact that it wasn't able to be sustained over time? Were they just not committed in the way that they needed to be? I think it's more that the, the nation state is really not particularly strong. Mm -hmm. 
And also Argentina developed in a very odd way. If you ask other Latin Americans now about Argentina, I mean, the common joke they'll make is Argentinians imagine they're, they're Europeans. Yeah. <laughs> they're just geographically situated in a, in a, in a different place. They kept that kind of European identity, I think. I think that's involving too. So the people didn't really imagine themselves as Americans in any sort of sort of way. I think that's what's going on. Let's talk a little bit about the way the Tornquists managed this growing empire of businesses that they had. What was their management structure like? Well, they had a management structure, but it wasn't a very uh, sophisticated yeah. one. And that reflects the fact they're mostly not doing very sophisticated things. You know, finance, real estate, simple processing, commodities. It clearly worked because they perform very well. And the group absolutely survives after Tornquest dies. But it's not a sophisticated one. It's very much a family business. Mm. Uh, he grooms his son to take over, which he does. There appears to be very little investment in developing like professional managers of any kind. And there's a high reliance on recruiting managerial talent from Europe to man things rather than to develop their own, yeah. their own talent. And that's uh, fairly common. You see that in a lot of um, Latin American countries. You see family-owned yeah. enterprises. And, you know, is this the kind of uh, business that can sustain over time if you don't start to bring in some real talent within the organization and, and nurture that? I think it's sustainable. The greater problem is that you can't develop highly sophisticated businesses. As I said earlier, this, there's no Tornquest brand yeah. that develops, for example. There's no R&D facility that's created, which you've already got in U.S. businesses by the late 19th century. So that kind of business is not going to become a hub of innovation. Mm -hmm. Oh, it can survive. It can make a great deal of money. But what it does is not sophisticated. Yeah. You know, there are no Fords or Carnegie's being built in, the, in this period. It, yeah. it couldn't. Which leads to the vulnerability that we've seen happen since the time that the case was written. Well, it does because this business is built on the global economy and it's built on the hunger of growingly urban populations in Europe and the United States for food. And it seems to them at the time that's always going to happen. It doesn't happen. After Tornquest dies, you get World War One. then you get the Great Depression, then you get tariffs. Mm -hmm. And suddenly your commodity export business is in a huge amount of trouble and you have nothing to replace it. You don't have the kind of business that can really supply the domestic market or, you know, supply more different types of markets. So a commodity-based export economy is highly vulnerable to global shocks. Mm -hmm. And we've had that in more recent periods too. Yeah. And again, we see a parallel to what's happening today with uh, the Trump administration and the tariff, the trade wars that are you know, looming above us. The, the tariffs that Argentina was imposing were something along the lines of 30%, I yeah. think, the case sites. Can you talk a little bit about the strategy there? What were they trying to achieve? If you want to see it as a strategy, the government was trying to get manufacturing industries to develop. And that's because, as I said, they had a real problem because their market was very small. So that kind of made a some sort of sense, but the tariffs were very high and imposed very high costs. In a less, more cynical way, you know, people like Tornquist were an enormous beneficiary yeah. of these kind of tariffs. Um, and he used them, for example, in the sugar industry to build up a very large business, larger than it was needed by the domestic market, which is very inefficient, but very profitable for him. Yeah. Do you think that the Tornquist phenomenon could happen today? I mean, is the world in just a different place where it wouldn't be possible for a, a family to create this kind of an enterprise? Oh, absolutely not. I think you look all over Latin America, Asia. Still happening. <laughs> Africa. Uh, what you've got is large family-owned diversified groups. That's, you know, the typical structure in India, typical structure across Latin America. I mean, the more successful ones – have introduced um, layers of professional management. But the, you know, in almost every case, the family is still is still up there. Is that uh, a problem? I mean, as we look at what happened in this case, does that leave the same exposure there? Uh, there are several problems. One is that families disagree. And so the next generation, the whole business can fragment with different parts going to different brothers or mm -hmm. occasionally sisters. So that, that is a huge issue. 
On the other hand, businesses like Tata in India show that you can go into the fifth or sixth generation of families and have a business and have a business that can do quite sophisticated things like from autos to management consultancy. So it is possible if you can find the right mixture of professional management and family ownership. It always always depends on like the values of the family. If the family has like strong set of values, if it has mechanisms to enable the more competent members of the family to take decisions and do something with the less competent members of the family, it can work quite well and it can actually give rise to a you know a more sustainable business than a business dependent on you know, short-term capital markets. Yeah. But it's a tricky one and there are lots of, lots of trade-offs. Yeah. I think about the uh, case, uh, one of your colleagues, Ryan Raffaele, wrote a case on Faber-Castell, the, the pencil company, which I think is in their sixth generation of family mm. run. But they're, a, they're in an isolated industry. It's a very niche thing. So I see this as quite different where the diversification makes it mm. more complicated in many ways. Of course, the U.S. has big business. The Cargills, for example, mm. it's a fifth or sixth generation. It's a giant and successful company. So it's, even in the U.S., it's quite possible to run this kind of business. Yeah. But there are many trade-offs. <laughs> Yes. So uh, you mentioned you wrote this case for your history class, and have you discussed it uh, in class? And I'm curious what the students... Yeah, I think I must have taught it about 10 times now. Wow. It typically uh, goes very well, and I think the reason for that is we have a lot of students now from uh, emerging markets, and the case totally uh, resonates with them. They say, oh, yeah, we've got all these business groups, and they're run by families, and they'll pretty much focus quite quickly on the on the trade-offs and the issues here. Some group these groups now, like in the past, are quite effective for driving um, economic growth. I mean, Tornquest is pioneering new businesses and everything else. On the other hand, these groups are like octopuses, which mm-hmm. are into everything. So it's really hard for a new generation of entrepreneurs to get going because these groups fill the place. And the second thing they all focus on is his close relationship with the political elite, Mm -hmm. because that kind of crony capitalism is prevalent still in multiple countries and is a huge problem. I think hopefully, like all my cases, it has some deep historical learning, but a lot of direct relevance to people now as they think about their own countries and how to move things forward. Yeah, it, it certainly came across that way to me. So, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us today. That's great. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed hearing about the Tornquists making a fortune in the Pampas, you may also enjoy some of our other Cold Call episodes. You can find them on Apple Podcasts. And while you're there, please leave a review. Thanks for listening. I'm Brian Kenny, your host, and you've been listening to Cold Call, an official podcast of Harvard Business School.